Hello, my name is Nicholas Harlow and I'm the gunnery manager at James Purdy & Sons. Today I would like to share with you a brief history of Purdy, which spans three centuries. From our beginnings in Leicester Square in 1814, we have been producing the finest bespoke sporting arms and have been the preferred choice of monarchs and nobility for virtually our entire existence. To this day, we are still considered the king of gunmakers. But where does this story start? Family tradition states that the Purdies are descended from French Huguenots who immigrated to Scotland sometime in the 1600s. Around the beginning of the 18th century, our founder's grandfather walked from Edinburgh to London in search of work. The family settled in the Minories, an area around the Tower of London that was the centre of gun production in that period. There they worked as blacksmiths, producing gun barrels for the trade. Our founder, James, would have entered the family trade had his father not died when James was 12, as recorded in the family Bible you see here. Instead, James was apprenticed to his brother-in-law in 1798. In that period, an apprenticeship lasted seven years, and during that time the apprentice was specifically banned from drinking, playing cards and fornication. In return, the master would house, feed and clothe his apprentice. Today, apprenticeships last five years and although no longer required to live together, they follow the same process of a master, or gaffer, passing on his knowledge and skills through practical demonstration. Where they differ is that today's apprentices will have a greater familiarity with technology alongside the handcrafts which quite literally built the company. Upon completing his apprenticeship in 1805, James worked for Joseph Manton, the original king of gunmakers. James was a well-respected craftsman, so much so that Manton, although not usually known for compliments, admitted that James's work was almost equal to his own. In 1814, James set up on his own, just off Leicester Square. For those who know it, our first shop was located roughly where the M&M store is today. We remained there until 1826, when we relocated to Oxford Street. Few guns survived from this period. This gun is one of the earliest, number 86. We believe that it was made by the founder himself, and it remains in our possession today. Our guns have always been prized for their functionality as much as their embellishments. The idiom for a complete gun is perhaps one of the most recognisable in the English language and encompasses the three basic parts of a gun, lock, stock and barrel. Our founder was a stockmaker, but was responsible for more than just the shape of the stocks on his guns, refining the overall look and handling as well. This combination of form and function created a distinctive purdy shape which remains the basis for our design aesthetic today as you can see in this video. It appears that from the beginning, James numbered his guns. Our surviving records start in the early 1820s and this number sequence has been continued to this day. Each entry contains at least the basic production details in a similar manner to a tailor's records. Major alterations and changes of ownership are also still added to these original records. By the beginning of the 20th century, we have produced guns for not only the British royal family, but many of the major houses of Europe as well, as can be seen on this letterhead from the 1910s. The seven coats of arms are, clockwise from bottom left, the King of Portugal, Prince Henry of Prussia, the King of Sweden, King Edward VII, the King of Spain, Archduke Franz Ferdinand and the Tsar of Russia. The Royal Warrants recognise that we supply services to that member of the Royal Household and are considered a distinct honour. We received our first Royal Warrant in 1868 as gunmaker to the Prince of Wales. Ten years later we became gunmaker to the Queen, and we have fulfilled that role ever since. Today, out of 816 Royal Warren holders, we are one of only 14 companies to hold all three warrants. Here you can see the current Queen's warrant, flanked by those of her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, and son, the Prince of Wales. Our relationship with the family actually started even earlier, 
with the first recorded sale to the royal family taking place in 1838. This was for a pair of pistols purchased on behalf of Queen Victoria that we believe were presented to the Imam of Muscat and can be seen in this entry here. As part of this relationship, we have not only built and maintained guns and rifles for the family, but also novelties such as this pair of guns, together with suitably scaled accessories, built for Queen Mary's doll's house in the 1920s. The half crown is about the size of a two pound coin or two euro piece. Perhaps the most famous miniature guns are a pair of one sixth scale hammer guns presented to King George V for his Silver Jubilee in 1935. They are only about 6 inches or 15 centimetres long when assembled and were presented in a silver case made by the king's jewellers Garrards. They were also fully functional with their own special ammunition, miniaturised Ely cartridges. The gun you see being assembled was constructed as a backup to the manufacturing process and is virtually identical to the pair. This gun was presented to Tom Purdy, the last of the family to manage the company directly, for his 41st birthday in 1938. It remains on display in our collection today. By the end of the 1850s, James had retired from the business, leaving it in the hands of his son, James the Younger, seen in the picture on the right. He had been trained by his father and continued the same attention to form and function, but also brought a particularly inventive streak to the company. He successfully registered seven patents, two of which remain in use to this day. One of these, the locking mechanism to hold the barrels to the action, commonly known as purdy bolts and highlighted here, are as ubiquitous to gun making as the lever escapement is to watch making. This spirit of invention was shared by our craftsmen, many of whom helped to create and develop the designs we build today. The most celebrated was Frederick Beasley, who developed the classic purdy side-by-side -side shotgun action with James the Younger's financial backing in 1880. By 1890 it had reached the same basic configuration that we still build today. This is perhaps the closest the London gun trade has to an iconic design and is recognised around the world. Beasley's design came at the end of our time in our second premises. When we had moved to Oxford Street in 1826 it had been an expansion into much larger premises with a factory at number 314 and the shop at 315. However there was one problem. The numbering on the street was not yet standardised, and another gunmaker was at the other 315 Oxford Street. In response, from early 1827 we began to trade from 314 and a half Oxford Street, an address that was continued up until we left in 1883. James the Younger was born in a flat above the shop, trained here under his father, and patented all of his inventions here as well. It was also where he chose to bring two of his sons into the business, making us James Purdy and Sons in December 1877. By that time, Oxford Street was no longer large enough, nor was it fitting to the level of clientele the company now supplied. With the agreement of the Duke of Westminster, James the Younger purchased four plots of land on South Audley Street for his new premises, construction of which started in 1881. He named his creation Audley House, and it was described shortly after it opened in 1883 as a palace among gun manufactories. It is the last survivor of the golden age of gunmaking and where we have made our home for nearly 140 years. Up until the 1990s, the first room you enter in Audley House was the only one many clients would ever see. Here the day-to-day -day business of a gunmaker was carried out and you can see from the photograph on the left, taken in 1904, just how busy that business could be. In the basement and on the upper floors, new guns were stocked, engraved and finished with the barrels and actions having been made up at a second site just north of Grosvenor Square. We also hand-loaded cartridges in the attic of Audley House up until the 1950s. At its height, we were producing in excess of 2.5 million cartridges per year. Perhaps more worryingly, when the space was cleared in the 1990s, several sacks worth of loose gunpowder was collected from the floor space. At the rear of the building was the company's showroom, which also provided an office space for the Purdy family. It was here that clients would place their orders for new guns. The boxing you can see in the highlighted image is a light well, allowing light down into the basement for the craftsmen working there, as well as a method of instant communication between the factory and the family. Over time, this room became very much a space apart from the day-to-day -day business, reserved for the owners to work in as well as meet and entertain both clients and friends. Today this room is simply known as the long room, 
and is so well known that gun enthusiasts from around the world travel to visit it. By the end of the 1890s, it was clear that having manufacturing over multiple sites was far from ideal, and so all departments were centralised at a new factory at Irongate Wharf, near Paddington Station. A phone was installed next to the long room to allow the family to call the factory directly. It was one of the first telephones in London, and is still there today, albeit unconnected. During the First World War, we supported the war effort in several ways. 32 craftsmen joined up to fight, alongside both of Athel Purdy's sons, Jim and Tom. The company was lucky, as only one of these men did not return in 1918. At the same time, we also worked on various high-precision items, including sniper rifles and the Norman Sight, designed for use in aerial combat and seen in the image below. As seen in our 1910 letterhead, our pre-war market had been predominantly European. In 1919, this market was virtually non-existent, and so Athol took the step of taking a berth on the RMS Olympic in 1922 to seek orders in America. His first trip was just a month to New York, and this photograph is the only one known from that trip. At the end of his time, Athol had secured much-needed orders. He also brought back requests for specialist competition shotguns, such as the single-barreled trap gun and the more modern over and under. Although the company had no pre-existing designs for either, it was able to develop models to meet those demands by the end of 1925. Athol's son, Tom, joined the business in 1920, shortly after leaving the Air Force, and was thoroughly trained by his father in the necessary skills to act as a salesman and manage Audley House. Money was still very short, and so Tom's older brother, Jim, joined the company as a director in 1925, bringing with him investment from his in-laws. This led to Purdy becoming a limited company, but the brothers struggled to come to terms with not having total control over the company's direction of finances, much to the frustration of their investors. The company struggled through the Depression, continuing to innovate to meet demand. This included starting a secondary factory to produce precision gauges for the military shortly before the outbreak of war. This war was to come far closer to home than World War I. A bomb landed just outside Audley House in April 1941, blowing all the windows out and leaving the shrapnel marks that can still be seen on the facade today. The photograph is particularly unusual, as photography of bomb damage was strictly censored at that time. The long room was unharmed by the blast, and in 1943 was used by Eisenhower's Invasion Committee for the early stages of planning D-Day. In 1946, the company was once again in need of both orders and investment. In desperation, Tom Purdy talked to Hugh Seeley, who agreed to provide the necessary investment. In 1949, Hugh gave the company to his nephew, Richard Beaumont, in lieu of a cottage in a duck pond. Richard was trained by Tom for the next six years, until Tom retired in 1955, when management and ownership of the company was once again controlled by a single individual. This photograph was taken at a company outing shortly before Tom's retirement, and Richard Beaumont is seated second from the left. In 1948, Purdy were approached by another gunmaker, James Woodward and Sons. They had taken a direct hit during the war, and the family were looking to retire. In return for the right to build their over and under design, seen on the left here in a much simpler and more popular design than that which we had developed in the 1920s, we purchased the company. Their design, suitably refined to fit the Purdy style, remains our premier model to this day and can be seen in the photograph in the middle. The photo on the right shows Tom and Harry Lawrence examining one of the first guns made by Purdy on the Woodward design. The post-war period was particularly difficult for the trade in general, with a combination of high taxation and rapid inflation making our guns particularly expensive. There was also the period of strikes and power outages, which led the factory to temporarily return to gaslighting and burned scrapped stockwood for warmth. In the late 1970s, our factory site in Paddington was redeveloped, and we moved to our current site near Hammersmith. You can see the combination of both hand tools and milling machines that existed even then. In the mid-1970s, we became the first gunmaker to introduce a range of clothing and accessories under the control of Richard's wife, Lavinia. This led to the opening of a dedicated shop on Mount Street in 1979, which ran semi-independently from the main business. Indeed, there was no internal communication, and clients had to exit Audley House and go down Mount Street to the accessory shop's entrance at number 84. Lavinia's work with other country brands, particularly Schoffel and Barber, 
influenced some of their most successful lines and remain in production today. In 1994, Richard decided to retire and sold the company to Vendôme, which three years later became Richemont. Audley House was reorganised and refurbished, and Jim's great-grandson, Richard Purdy, was invited to join the company as chairman. Nigel Beaumont, Richard Beaumont's cousin, served as managing director until 2007 when he became chairman himself. He oversaw our bicentenary celebrations in 2014, when Richemont presented us with a new factory which was opened in 2015, and we hope it will serve us well into our third century. Today we continue to operate from Audley House, now almost 140 years old. The clothing and accessories now occupy not only their original area, but also the first two rooms of the ground floor. The long room is the gun room once more, as well as displaying portraits and artefacts of both the Purdy family and their clients. The space is also used for events, including the Purdy Awards, which support Game Conservancy in Britain and that we have now been running for 20 years. Thank you for watching this presentation on the history of James Purdy and Sons. As you will appreciate, there is far more to our story than can be included here, and we are happy to answer any questions that you might have. We would also be delighted to welcome you to Audley House, where you can experience our history and products for yourself. We hope to see you there soon.